Amazing. Um, Eva, can I guess, just get you to uh, get confirmation? Can you see the screen? Yes. I can see it. Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so um, as Eva mentioned, my full name is Faria Alia Shah. I'm a lens-based artist, and uh, this is a little bit about my practice. Um, I started off as a dancer uh, many years ago. I started uh, dancing ballet when I was five years old in Edmonton. Um, I had an opportunity to move to Houston, Texas when I was seven years old. And uh, this is a picture of myself and Lauren Anderson, who was the first black female um, uh, lead or prima ballerina for the, the company, the Houston Ballet Academy. Um, and it was probably the first time that I saw someone who looked like me in a prime, pretty much a central stage. Um, and so it was a big deal for me to be in this area, or excuse me, to be uh, surrounded by her, to be supported by her. Um, and I would say that this is probably the beginning of my artistic endeavors. Um, I was a dancer up until I was about 18 or so. Um, and then I had I'd stopped uh, dancing and movement continues to be part of my artistic practice. So I always like to kind of start my trajectory here at this moment. Um, I also played uh, the violin growing up, and so uh, music, dance, visual arts, these types of things were always um, kind of incorporated in, in my life, and they, I think you'll see later how they kind of blended into my artistic practice. Um, I attended OCA University um, after studying human resources. I thought that um, I wouldn't make it as an artist. I remember having conversations with some folks um, when I was in high school. Um, my high school was in Markham and um, we had a dark room and I really fell in love with the photographic practice and process at that time. Um, but I had a friend, not so friend, <laughs> tell me that, you know, you won't make it as a, as a photographer, you won't make it as an artist. This is just a hobby. Um, and I really took that to heart. So I went and I studied human resources instead. Um, the guidance counselor at the time told me that it was the artistic form of business. And I, I bought that hook, line and sinker. <laughs> I came to later realize it was not, it is not. Um, but I'm quite thankful that I had that, uh, that experience because a lot of the, um, a lot of my experience, a lot of uh, my interests from, uh, I guess, uh, learning about people, um, uh, la labor laws, these types of things were, are really baked into, um, into that practice in human resources. Um, understanding people, what makes people take these types of things, observation of people. So I guess before I even picked up um, something from a visual perspective, I was already doing this type of um, this, this type of research with people. Um, so fast forward my career after I graduated from York, I went and I studied at OCAD. And um, this was uh, in my second year, I created this piece. It's a, a, a two channel installation called Part of a Complete Breakfast. Um, and I completed it over two years. And um, it was the very first time that I played with, um, with video and sound, um, mixing uh, medium from uh, found images to historical images, um, shot original shot images. And I really fell in love with the process of using different types of media. And um, I remember my faculty member at the time uh, letting me know that I didn't necessarily have to stick with photography if um, it wasn't the medium that was going to tell the story that I wanted to tell. So um, I really like to talk about this in terms of my trajectory because it was the first time that I got to be comfortable and confident in another uh, lens-based medium. And then uh, that's also been a part of my practice uh, from here. Um, in 2014, I had the opportunity to visit Jamaica. I was uh, um, with family and uh, my, my family is originally from Guyana uh, in South America, but my cousin uh, was marrying somebody who was originally from Jamaica. And so we went and had the wedding there. And it was my very first time on a resort. Um, and it was a very jarring experience knowing the history of Jamaica, how, uh, knowing that they had rebelled and fought against slavery, um, and then seeing these slave-like tropes on those resorts. And so with those images fresh in my mind, I came back home and uh, put together this piece, um, thinking about the Mammy character, thinking about um, the image of slave-like characters and caricatures and how um, the power of the image is, is very present in our uh, current everyday life. So I was examining um, common things like um, uh, vaudeville characters. I was uh, looking at um, 
Aunt Jemima, the character on the, the syrup. I was looking at the character on uh, the, the Rasmus character on the Cream of Nature uh, box and doing some digging and exploring uh, into, you know, the history of these, these characters and then seeing how those historical images popped up in, uh, in different mediums. Um, so that was my, my first time kind of playing with that. I really enjoyed it. it obviously quite disturbing to <laughs> uncover those things and start to kind of build my research. But um, it was the first time that I had the opportunity to do that within my practice. Alrighty, and then in 2016, um, I outside of you know mixing sound and video clips um, I spent some time cultivating a piece called prefix uh, which explored my uh, my background. Um, I titled it Prefix because I was concerned. Um, this was my thesis body of work and I was concerned what it was going to be like um, as an artist being constantly asked where I was from. Um, am I going to have the prefix black in front of my title every time I introduce myself free as a black artist, free as a, a black this, black that. Um, not to say that I'm not proud of my heritage but um, what does blackness read in, in our society? Um, how am I going to have to push against uh, the history of blackness um, and have these conversations and constantly uh, tell people where I'm from, even though I had been born in Canada, um, you know, witnessing other folks who were, were non-racialized, not being asked these questions. Um, this was a very frustrating kind of process for me. Um, in 2015, my mom and I uh, went to Spain and, and spent some time in Morocco. It's my first time in Africa. I was very, very excited. And as soon as I, you know, enter <laughs> the space, I was also asked with these questions. And I'm like, when am I not going to be asked these questions? Here I, I'm coming back to the motherland and I'm supposed to not be asked these questions, but here I am confronted with these, these types of questions. So in my practice, this is what I continue to explore, uh, the history of the term or the idea of blackness, um, uh, looking at cultural identity, looking at my family history, looking at colonialism and how all of these things uh, play a part in, in the reading of my identity and the presentation of my identity. Um, this was the very first piece that I used studio lighting and I got really comfortable with, uh, with this setting. Um, and I think it was the first time that I cultivated, uh, I think stylistically, something that um, has stuck with me. Um, so for me, this was an important piece and I always, I love to, to share it with folks. Um, the piece also was accompanied by uh, steeped tea bags. Um, and so as, uh, I think I believe there were six tea bags, excuse me, six frames of tea bags, um, a framed steeped tea. And um, I was also looking at the transfer transformation of like um, products in relation to the movement of my my family history. So in Guyana, if you folks are not familiar, um, it had been colonized several times over by the British, by the Dutch, by the French, uh, by a few other folks. And uh, lastly, by the British and, and um, my family is from British Guyana. And so I was interested in mapping out um, or making correlations to the movement of my family through these through commodities, um, through slave labor, um, through uh, my half of my family is is East Indian. Um, so the production of tea, the production of rice, uh, bringing indentured laborers in from uh, India. Um, what did, what did, how did all of these symbols play into my identity? So this was the first time that I was able to cultivate something beyond just images and I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's, it's evident in my work today that the, the desire to have a multimedia experience or to push my medium beyond just lens based, um, trying to use different ways to tell the story that I'm interested in. Um, this is prefix again um, uh, at Union Station, um, and I left this in the presentation um, really to kind of discuss a little bit of what's going on in Toronto today. Um, uh, an artist, a Black artist in Toronto, um, a work was defaced with um, uh, essentially with, with a racial um, I can't, I can't even describe now <laughs> what it what what that was, but it was defaced with like a, um, a racial marking um, and a symbol. And 
So I wanted to leave this, this in here to perhaps have a discussion with folks if, if they're curious of what it means to be a Black artist. Again, thinking about the idea of why I titled this piece Prefix in 2016, it's 2022, we're still having conversations about respecting Black artists, getting safe, having safe spaces for Black folk. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of leave this in here uh, as a reminder that um, I might be offered space at a table, but um, I'm not always um, respected. Uh, and Black artists are not always respected when they're given those spaces. Um, after the piece at Union Station this year was defaced, um, it took a week before somebody was able to uh, notify the authorities. Um, and essentially a slave collar was put onto one of the, one of the images. So, so yeah, it, it's been a pretty heavy, it, it continues to be a pretty heavy, heavy time. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to keep this in here um, to perhaps have a conversation about um, this ongoing dialogue of Black bodies, who owns Black bodies, um, how are our bodies portrayed um, in space. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Guyana in 2017, and um, uh, it was after I graduated, um, not having access to gallery space, excuse me, to uh, studio space, um, I started to push my, my artistic creativity and uh, my process outside of the studio, um, and was doing a lot more um, shooting in, in natural light, shooting in space, um, and so this piece uh, is a little bit about grief. It's definitely about uh, colonization, about the history of uh, my family specifically, the resiliency of um, uh, the folks who are in um, the town that my parents are from. They're from a small uh, space called Victoria Village, and they have a really, really rich history of pushing back collectively um, against colonial powers. And I, I gain a lot of not just respect, but that fire to kind of have these conversations. Um, it was really invigorating to see that in this space. Um, and it made a lot of sense as to why I was interested so much in it, because my ancestors were so much interested in pushing back against uh, colonization. This is my uncle uh, in my grandmother's home, uh, just on the, on the back steps. Um, so yeah, I, I really love uh, speaking about this work and um, uh, sharing a different perspective of my practice all, all along the same themes. Um, later on in 2017 to 2019, I cultivated a piece called Looking for Lucille. Um, and this body of work explored um, the history of my maternal grandmother. I was interested in fleshing out her story a little bit more. Um, she passed away the year before I was born. Um, and I, uh, she was a figure that was very present in my life, even though I, I never physically knew her. Um, and so within this series, um, I tried something new in terms of needlepoint, and I wanted to incorporate this because um, I made a goal for myself that I would uh, learn a little bit more in terms of textiles, in terms of embroidery. My grandmother was a seamstress. My grandfather was a tailor on my father's side. Um, so this is also something um, within my family history that I wanted to incorporate um, into my practice. Um, and right before um, uh, Ava and I met, I was cultivating this piece uh, and working very closely with my mom. Uh, it's called And With These Hands. Um, I think topically it's really nice to touch on before I, I jump into the series at um, that we're talking about here at Stride, what's, what's open at Stride, um, because of the fixation of hands, because of the fixation of um, uh, body, uh, culture, identity. Again, the same threads are, are repeated. I also, uh, within this piece, got to collaborate with my mom and sister. And in the piece that you folks will are we'll see at, at Stride. I also collaborated with my mom and sister, so it was beyond the use of my own body. Um, and uh, within this particular piece, I was exploring the idea of um, emotional labor. Um, it's, a, it's a single channel a video installation, and it incorporates um, snippets of interviews with my mother, and it also incorporates um, a speech by Angela Davis um, from the 70s. Um, speaking at UCLA at a conference, and I was matching and comparing and contrasting the, the message that was uh, being shared there. Um, and again, these are 
common tools that I use in my practice in terms of utilizing um, historical documents, um, bringing new life uh, to conversation. Um, sometimes it's extremely jarring because the things that had been said in the past, I can just leave them and they're still accurate um, today. Uh, and you'll probably see that a little bit more in the piece um, uh, that I created for, for Stride. So here we are. <laughs> this is, these are the, the works that um, are um, uh, currently at the gallery. And um, I'm quite proud of this series. Um, it is an extensive body of work. And um, uh, it took about a year, a little over a year to produce research, everything that went into the, the process and the experience. Um, I think in my practice, you folks can now see the, the interest in symbolism, the interest in, I have a, a strong interest in iconography. So some of these shapes are very similar to like his, um, the history of photography and things that kind of emerge out of that space. Um, and so, yes, in creating this, be, this piece, um, I was thinking about a lot of different things. Um, I remember in conversations with Ava about my practice, she, she said something to me um, and it was, I see that you're, um, you kind of wait to respond to something. Um, and that's, that's 100% accurate. Um, there will be something in, in history or something in present day that will spark an opportunity for me or a drive for me to respond uh, or a desire for, for me to, to make a response. And um, for me, it, it was conversations around Black liberation. Um, it was conversations about liberation movements, period. I was um, kind of taken aback uh, by, I think, as everybody, by the last two years, um, watching, watching society watch itself. Um, watching people be exposed to the hurt, the pain, the truth of what um, lived experiences uh, of other folks um, had been happening and uh, still a denial, still a, uh, a lack of understanding uh, of what folks were truly going through. And so this piece is very much a response um, to that, to all that noise. <laughs> Um, and I was really ref reflecting on, we have, we have definitely been here before. There have been opportunities for the world, for society to kind of make a shift and, and a positive change. Um, and I, I, I started to do research and really think about what is prompting us not to move past this moment. Um, how are we still ending up in the same place? How are we still having the same conversations we've been having generations before. Um, so, so that's really at the core uh, what the piece is about. Um, there's one series that I, I didn't include in the, uh, the presentation here, and that's uh, Billy Said Strange Fruit. Um, and in that particular series, I was really honing in on the history of photography. Um, as, a, as a fresh grad, I, I put that piece together in 2017. And as a recent graduate, um, I was reflecting on what I had learned my four years in university, this very Eurocentric lens of photography, um, not really knowing any Black artists, <laughs> to be honest, while I was in school, except for Carrie Mae Weems. I was the only Black artist I was familiar with, photographer that I was familiar with. Um, and anybody that I had conversation with, as soon as they saw me, they're like, do you know Carrie Mae? And I was like, yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do you know anybody else? <laughs> Um, uh, so, so reflecting on, um, how I had viewed blackness through the history of photography, what that canon was, um, and my desire to add to the canon, to add to that conversation. Um, and so in, in, uh, Billy said strange fruit, I was really looking at, um, the amount of flora and fauna that's in the history of photography against black bodies, um, and challenging the viewer as I put as I put those flora and fauna together um, to respect black bodies in the same vein as, as plants. Like that's, that's the level that we're at right now. Um, I'd like you to respect blackness on the same level that you have respect for flora and fauna. Um, and those are the same conversations that I'm, I'm still having. So in this particular piece, um, I'm breaking down 
elements uh, and the, again reflecting on the history of photography um, the piece was inspired by doing research on Shirley cards and if you folks aren't familiar this is a process uh, by which when color photography was being produced um, uh, the color calibration was the uh, the way that the color was being cali calibrated was against white skin tone um, that was that's the normal that's normal and so the effect of that is anybody who doesn't match that skin tone, you can be black, you can be Asian, you could be essentially anything but white. Um, your skin tone isn't going to come out the way that it's supposed to, that, that it naturally looks. So black folks are either going to be extremely washed out, um, looking inhumane, um, uh, and the process did not change. It was not challenged until uh, companies such as furniture companies, chocolate companies, um, complained to these spaces that were producing, uh, that were um, that were in charge of these processes, um, that the color of wood and chocolate weren't coming out the same way. So it was difficult for them to sell their products. So, you know, in in Billy said strange fruit, uh, flora and fauna are more important than black bodies or a nuance of having a conversation around blackness. And um, in this era, uh, a stretch of like thirty years, um, wooden furniture chocolate, commodification of other things are more important than uh, humanizing, making sure that a process um, is able to reflect, um, you know, a, a group of people or a larger group of people outside of white folks. So that is, was the impetus for me to produce this work. Um, in those Shirley cards, the, uh, the model, initially her name is Shirley, Shirley I've written it down and it's escaped my mind, but I'll come back to it. <laughs> um, but um, she used to wear these white gloves in the images. Um, the, the stage was really um, kind of dramatic. Think 90s portraiture, like that kind of very heavy uh, draping and fabric in the background. Um, and so I, this is my interpretation of those Shirley cards, but just uh, now abstract um, and incorporating things like chocolate, like wooden furniture legs against uh, my body, against my mother's body, the third image, the first and third image, um, it has both my hands, my mother's hands and my sister's. Um, and, and so yes, making compare, comparing uh, how different and sometimes how similar the, the shades of, of color are and, and things of that nature. So really, I want the I want the viewer to sit with these images, uh, wonder about the construction of them. Um, I think in space they're quite striking, um, and so at first perhaps you're drawn into maybe the lighting of it, um, and then I hope that folks are spending a little bit more time to understand or question why um, these bodies or these figures are positioned next to these objects. Um, Shirley also wore a lot of pearls, and so um, the positioning of pearls is, is also in here. Um, the positioning of pearls on women, on female identified bodies um, as a social status is also something that I'm, I'm thinking about as well. So as I continue to talk about the work, you folks can hear there are layers upon layers upon layers of research um, and meaning be behind each image and behind each kind of creation. We'll move on. Um, in this set of images, um, I'm using fake plants. So in, in Billy Said Strange Fruit, I'm using fresh, uh, fresh uh, plants, flora and fauna. And in this series, I'm, I'm using um, fake plants. Um, and it is intentional. It is to, to comment on kind of the fickle nature of white supremacy. Um, these, these elements are built on a lie. They are built on a manifestation of somebody is superior and somebody is inferior. Um, and so I position myself in front of these, um, I'm encountering these fake narratives uh, head on. Um, another slice of, of the images here. Um, I really enjoy um, the idea of weight, uh, the idea of magnitude in space, again, coming from that kind of dancery background. Uh, I'm playing with space. I'm playing with, um, with shapes and hand gestures. Um, and again, these are tropes within the history of photography that I'm also making commentary on, but now using black bodies. So um, yes, lo lots to kind of uncover and I'm very excited to have conversation with you folks if you have questions. Um, now, in addition to the set of images that are in the series, I believe there are, ooh, if I correct me if I'm wrong, there are 10, 
11, 11 images <laughs> um, within this series. Um, I do have a, a video installation. Um, I'm super happy to return to my love for video and, uh, and sound installation. Um, so in this, in this piece, it's called also a chair. I, I also wanted to share why I titled it this way. Um, I, I visited France for the first time in 2019 and um, I saw the piece and now I'm going to, to I'm, I'm going to forget the name of the, the piece, but you folks will know it. Yeah, it's a chair three ways. Yes, uh, uh, the text of a chair, like the definition, uh, an image of a chair and then the chair or something to that effect. Now I'm like, yes, yes, Ava is shaking, yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> and so that was kind of fresh in my mind. The experience of um, uh, watching uh, or witnessing ready-mades like by Duchamp and by all these folks um, was kind of fresh in my mind. And also uh, in the, the gallery that I visited in Paris, um, I witnessed the magnitude of, um, um, oh, now the words are escaping my mind, um, a curiosity cabinet. And it was quite overwhelming. I remember like literally losing my breath, being like really disturbed by, um, by the magnitude of what was in front of me, uh, of all these stolen, stolen artifacts from folks uh, from different countries, different spaces. Um, stripped from uh, their creators, stripped from their original narratives, and now in this space behind a, a, a you know a giant glass. So I was reflecting on all of these experiences, and um, uh, there is um, a, a chair in my basement that I, I had um, co-opted. It I was looking at ways to photograph it. It wasn't really coming out from a photographic standpoint. Um, and I remember one thing that I wanted to accomplish with this piece was the idea of dropping the curtain um, to reflect on my experience of dealing with folks during, you know, the last three years, um, feeling as though I was very exposed. Um, things that I had talked only with Black folk or with BIFOC folk were now out in the forefront. And um, I was kind of witnessing people's discomfort uh, to discuss topics. And so it was really important for me to drop uh, the facade um, and show the background. So showing, exposing lights, exposing um, uh, this chair and exposing uh, the backdrop. And um, there is a mixture of sounds. Um, they are pulled from a variety of historical sources, conversations of folks um, pretty much across the era, uh, the 30 year span that uh, it took Kodak to change its processes. Um, so that was the, the time frame that I was working with. Um, and they're layered on top of each other. I found this gem of a, of a, a sample um, um, that was a, uh, a historical conversation or um, it was almost like a promotion um, that black folk were going to be, it was important to understand that they had buying power and to make sure that your products are serving to black folk or that you, you understand how you can kind of use these folks that you've been continuing to use um, in different ways. Um, and so that is a, a through line um, note that is in this, uh, this piece. Um, and then there are other conversations of um, folks asking for their freedom, their humanity to be uh, on the forefront. So it's really meant, there's also snippets of like Codex commercials flipped in there as well. Um, so uh, it's really meant for you to sit and absorb um, and to listen to each layer piece by piece. You really have to sit with the piece for a while um, because of how I layered it. Um, some of it is a little bit muddled on purpose. So you folks can um, really absorb each layer one by one, uh, the more that you spend time um, with the work. Uh, and so across the chair it, um, is positioned, um, again, clippings of historical uh, pieces, a little bit from that, that, uh, that promotional video, um, and a little bit of other things of uh, that represent blackness and uh, how society is using blackness um, to it to its advantage constantly. Um, and then last but not least, we come to uh, my return to, you know, trying out with fabrics, trying out with uh, embroidery here. Um, and I've written down, let me just go to it the meaning behind each of the, uh, the pieces that are embroidered here. Um, 
So the, the color swatches I chose because around the Shirley cards, these are these would be the color swatches that were, were present um, in addition to other colors, but uh, I like the kind of the monochromatic uh, texture and color that would be in this in the space. Um, and so uh, the first image, it is uh, the Dutch um, East India Trading Company um, that is embroidered uh, on white fabric. Um, the next is, oh, this is not in order, but, <laughs> but I'll kind of skip to it. So the third one, one, two, three, the fourth one is um, a furniture company called Imperial Furniture. Um, uh, the one right next to it on the right hand, excuse me, two, two, two swatches down, um, it says the right kind of brown. Uh, tones, and that was a, a quote taken from uh, one of the articles that I was researching. Um, uh, one of the images says uh, Shirley Page, that was uh, the model's name. Um, that one is in light gray. Um, the mid brown, it, it has 78%, um, that's uh, the percentage of cocoa, uh, the chocolate that I was shooting. Um, uh, in gray, it says uh, it says normal again because the the white skin tone is is meant to be that normal skin tone, and I put it on gray because now we use the gray the gray card to to calibrate light. Um, and then on black, I have um, a piece of uh, film that is stitched into into the black black fabric. So um, I feel like I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to pause here to maybe open the floor for some questions and. Um, Maybe we can kind of get things going that way. Thank you so much. That is so, I mean, I've heard most of these stories before, but it's so refreshing to hear them again. Um, and also to think about them in, uh, you know, in conjunction with the exhibit. I feel like a lot of the things that I was hearing you talk about happened before we actually saw the work in the space. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting to think about it now, knowing exactly what the show looks like. Um, but yeah, please, if anyone has a question, you can either uh, use the raise hand function or you can leave a question in the chat. Um, I also have some of my own questions. Oh, actually, how about we go with Shamara's questions first? These are great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Shamara asks, I appreciate the brevity with which uh, you identified the colonial culture of Jamaican tourism with uh, part of a complete breakfast. It's often mm. a frustration uh, conversation to have with most non-POC who have grown up here in Canada. Is there, would you like to speak on that one? First? Yes, yes. Um, I've had the opportunity uh, now to visit a few different resorts and uh, to me, the the, the resort, the, the kind of the, hmm, oh, my headphones. Can you still hear me? Oh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, to me, the mm, travel tourism is a spin-off of colonization. Um, and so it's, it's really, really difficult. I have visited uh, our, uh, the Bahamas um Jamaica and uh and Mexico and, and was doing some work in conjunction with these resorts having conversations with folks who work there doing a little bit of investigation of uh the foreign companies that are owning these spaces Jamaica in particular I think um if folks are are more familiar they can correct me if I am if I misspeak but I believe there are two public beaches in Jamaica two or one public beaches that are, are remaining the rest are bought up by foreign um investors um, and that money goes back to those those spaces they are not it's not trickling down really to to the economy um, and so i i find this uh, as another method of colonization another method of um, reaping resources in different ways and sending them back to to those foreign spaces um, under the guise of you know your freedom your this your that um, and then also under the guise of it's safer at these resorts it's safer here than other spaces as if um as if folks don't understand the the notion of safety or as if um you know safety under only comes under the guise of whiteness um so these are definitely things that i'm uh, frustrated by and uh, continue to explore Um, yeah, and then Shamar is also speaking to um, the issue of Anique's photography at Union mm -hmm. Station. Um, 
she says that there's been some progress with locating who drew uh, the collar on the image. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a jarring experience. Um, and it, yeah, it definitely underscores the consideration you give to what spaces you allow to house or represent your work. How do you find yourself working within these kinds of hesitancies and concerns? This is actually a conversation Ava and I have been having a lot over the past year. Um, I've had to really uh, re-examine my relationships with folks, particularly within the art world. I, I think I'll start there because this is a, an art-based talk, um, but kind of examining my relationships with a lot of different spaces and distancing myself with spaces that are tokenizing, that are um, saying one thing, believing in decolonization, but doing very much the, uh, the opposite. Um, and so the first step has been to protect myself and it's been very difficult to uh, to separate myself from these spaces. Um, I think folks do this in a very cunning way that um, uh, I, I was questioning like am I the only one seeing this these patterns these things um, and I was like no 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 this is definitely this is definitely not the space that I want to be a part of or um, not not the it, it's, it's again under the guise of progression. <laughs> And it's the opposite. And so um, I've been spending a lot of time, again, doing that separation and then thinking about, well, uh, who are true allies? Who are folks who are really thinking along the same lines? Um, how are we going to dismantle these spaces? How are we going to build new spaces? Um, I've been talking a lot through this metaphor, uh, because I'm a photographer, <laughs> after you um, edit and edit and edit an image. If you're not careful on the, the on how you're editing the image, you degrade the quality of that image. And so, if we continue to degrade the quality of this image, it's it's worthless. You cannot do anything with it. It's it's um, it's destroyed. So the only solution is to start a new, to start to create a new image with new policies and new practices that uh, are truly um, in line with you know liberation and actively. Uh, looking to support folk uh, and not bring them down. So I, that can, I can talk about that for a very long time, <laughs> but I'll kind of leave it there. Sure. Um, and then the last one from Shamara, uh, she's sending you some well wishes right now. Um, and she also says, I can emphasize with the, difficult of the difficulty of the conversations that is prompted by the making of also a chair. It is such a necessary but difficult conversation to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, it was it was really hard. This was a, a very challenging piece to make because of the like the heaviness of the world, the heaviness of the content that I'm dealing with. I think emotionally it took a lot out of me and particularly editing that work. I'm listening to those words over and over again, seeing how I'm going to stitch them together. Um, and so it, it was mentally exhausting. I remember as soon as the, 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 um, the exhibition was posted, I, I also posted, I'm going to take a break until like the spring <laughs> just to give myself some distance from from the process of making. Um, I think artists don't really talk about that as much, uh, especially when we're dealing with uh, heavy content like this. Um, it is a form of emotional labor. Um, and I, I've been really reflecting on the labor of, you know, my body, my uh, representing blackness at, at times, um, being tokenized in these spaces and being asked to comment on certain things often <laughs> that uh, I'm like, wow, yeah, I, this really does take a toll. I, I do need to take a break. <laughs> so. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so we also have a question from Jordan. Um, They're wondering if you would, if you could speak to the technical aspects of honoring black and brown skin uh, folks on, uh, for lay folks like myself. Hmm. Um, the technical aspects of honoring, and uh, maybe some 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 clarity. Uh, could you clarify the the question? What do you mean? Uh, hello, I'll just uh, unmic and uh, put my camera on. It's probably easier than typing. Yes. Uh, I I want to understand how the Shirley cards failed us, right, and how. Mm. Uh, just from the craft perspective and uh, the technical aspect of representing 
these bodies how uh, that that wasn't being uh, uh, honored through the way that uh, the the sort of industry was approaching. These Amazing! Subjects. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that clarity. Um, that's such a great question. Um, I think as we as we started with the land acknowledgement today, I think folks uh, think that uh, it's it, that's the only thing that we need to do, uh, and and we kind of we've we've covered our bases. <laughs> and this, and similarly with um, speaking about black bodies, um, it's like yes, Black Lives Matter. Um, saying that out loud or putting the little uh, the little black square on your Instagram and then not following up with the things that kind of need to be done to dismantle uh, the frameworks that continue to oppress folk. Um, and so in regard to your question, Jordan, um, for me, the failing in the Shirley cards is to, to make the assumption that Black folks, that Brown folks, that people of color in general would not have the buying power. Like there was no thought process in mind that these folks would be able to use uh, this technology. Um, it would only be available to white folks. And that that's the market that we're catering to. That's the failing. Um, and I, I've, I've read so many different kind of critiques of, well, it was the technology at the time. I, I, I disagree. I feel like folks just, really held on to this idea that um, these bodies just wouldn't be important uh, enough to consider um, that it would only be used for a particular set of people. Um, and so I juxtapose that with the with the video um, and the commentary that's in that video that's also asking industries to take advantage of black buying power. So you have this dichotomy of you want to take advantage of the money that we produce uh, and the work that we have, but you also want to dis uh, disclude us from like a lot of society and, and look down upon us. So that's the kind of the conversation that I was uh, thinking about in terms of the failing of the technology. Um, and how do we continue to honor or, or how are those tropes still portrayed today? Um, I was reading another article quite recently, I think this was just last year, um, even though we've moved past using the Shirley cards, um, lightening black folks in images and in photographs is still a common practice. Um, and so, you know, those practices still exist, even though the technology has increased tenfold. Um, and so the issues still remain that um, we are still striving for a society that puts a pedestal, like puts whiteness on a pedestal um, and others, everything else. Um, so I think that's kind of, that would be my response to that. Absolutely. And something that um, was really interesting to me throughout uh, learning about the Shirley cards and uh, photography's history is just seeing how those kinds of things have progressed into uh, different technologies now, like even just thinking about like facial recognition mm -hmm. and stuff is something that's really shocking to think about. And people are, you know, very much experiencing that right now with like the the idea of not being able to like even, you know, unlock your phone if you don't look a certain way um, and like just racist coding in general. So it's very, it's, it's just like shocking to think that like all these things have basically just uh, translated into new uh, new forms of technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think about that. If I didn't leave human resources or um, the conversation around AI uh, and replacing kind of uh, humans doing that process of, of recruitment or going through resumes and things of that nature, um, it, that AI is often built by white folks, white male cis folk most of the time. And so <laughs> these ideas, these tropes, these harmful things are still perpetuated over and over and over again. Um, and so at what point do we say, you know, enough is enough, stop, how do we, how do we stop this cycle? Um, uh, and I think another thing that I'm questioning within the series is, is um, do we only stop a process when uh, we can still capitalize off of it. So I'm really also wanting folks to think about um, uh, capitalism as a as a framework. Is it sustainable truly for our society, um, or is it really tied to these harmful policies and principles as well? Absolutely. Um, and we have another question from Simone. Uh, she says, thank you so much, Faria, for sharing your story and journey. I really appreciate you mentioning how your work is often in response to something present and pressing within our society. 
uh, what is next for you? Self-preservation. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to take a break. <laughs> but but um, uh, I do have a solo exhibition coming up uh, at the McLaren in Barrie um, here in Ontario. And so um, there will be a mild break, but uh, my practice is never, never fully on pause. Um, I'm, I'm trying, I'm very, I'm working very hard on understanding boundaries and setting boundaries, but also abiding by the boundaries that I set. Because <laughs> it's one thing to kind of say them out loud, and then it's another thing to to uh, enact them. Um, so there are a few things that I am currently researching that have been ongoing uh, research related projects. Um, going back to the history of Guyana, um, a few years ago, I don't know, like, where has time gone? gone? But a few years ago, go, oil was found off the shores of Guyana. And uh, there was an article written called Black Gold uh, in the New York Times. And I, I, I'm like, there are so many ideas that I have with, uh, with the, the title alone, <laughs> with the context alone. And so that's something that I'm researching. I bought a book. It is not near me. It is not near me. But it is the working history of Guyana, um, excuse me, from the 1800s uh, to not the present day, because it's a bit of an older text. Um, I can't remember when the, the final date is, but um, I'm really excited to kind of dig through that um, and, and see what, what comes out of that. Uh, in terms of my practice, I sit with research for a long time. Um, and, and then something will kind of spark or I will watch something and I will say, ah, that's the visual cue that I needed to kind of prompt it into the next thing or, or I'll be testing out out different uh, technologies. And so that's probably what I'm going to be working on. I also have a collective uh, with my dear friend, um, Alexander Hong. Uh, it is called Master Collective. And so I'm hoping that we will get back and work together. Um, we did a residency this past summer. And uh, I'm, I'm, I love working with Alex. So I'm, I'm very excited to see where the, the collective goes. And it'll be a nice pause again from, from my personal practice. Definitely. First, first though, you're doing the self-preservation thing. <laughs> yes, yes. Rest. Lots of rest. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any other questions? You can also just turn on your camera and your mic if you'd like to, if you don't want to type in the chat. I have a question. Yes. I have my mic on. Um, uh, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to collaborate with your family, just when you were talking about um, you know, having your sister's arms and your mom's arms, and um, it's something I'm kind of passionate about too, but I also want to respect the sentiment you are sharing about how um, the art world can be a terrible and cruel, uh, oppressive place, and yes. how do you keep the ones you love safe? Yes, you know, oh, and, that's um, an touch on that. excellent, excellent question, and something that I think about often. Um, uh, making sure that I have their consent, <laughs> first and foremost, that I, I share um, almost, like I call them collaborators for a reason, because um, they are not just, um, they are not sitters, they are not, I, I want them to know um, the reason why I'm including them in the work and the reason why I would like to have that collaboration. Um, so there is definitely some input, even though at the end of the day, I'm the photographer and I have the final say on the framing or things of that, the editing. Um, there's a lot of conversation that goes on uh, before I just kind of um, either shoot my family or um, incorporate them in, in the work. And I'll speak specifically to the collaboration that I've had with my mom. We've had so many conversations and I think um, pre-COVID, I was in and out of the city often. I was never in, in Bradford. Um, and so COVID really forced me to be very, in like a very close proximity to, to my mom again, which is, was really nice. Um, and to have like the really deep conversations. And so um, I remember asking her like, can I record some of these? Can I write them down? Can I do this? Can I do that? And my mom, my mom is a very like, amazing person um, and uh, she's a bit sassy so she was like um, where's the craft table um, can I get a break <laughs> like my mom, my mom is a riot <laughs> are you gonna cut me a check and I was like yes mom I will pay you you are a collaborator yes 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 you know the giving the respect that she needs and I, I feel like she was really pushing it um, 
there was a, a few series that I had done in my earlier uh, work that I, I really collaborated a lot with my dad and I was telling more so uh, of his side of the story and my mom she cornered me one day and she was like and what about us what about my side of the family are you only photographing your dad because he's half East Indian and I was like no mom no I'm not are you trying to call me racist mom what's going on what's going on <laughs> she's sassy um so so um yeah, my mom is a riot. I love her to bits and uh, it, it's been really great to spend time with her. Um, and I think it's been cool to know her uh, more than just my mom, right? She's a, she has her own person, her own history. Um, it's tied to my history, but it's also uh, has its own trajectory in life. And so it's really cool to be able to um, flesh that out a little bit through my perspective with her blessing. Um, and then the same with my sister. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's been it's been a blessing to be able to work with them and um, have them be really excited that they are are in the work. Um, so yeah, it's a very long answer. But yes. <laughs> it's so beautiful. And especially in the way that you're saying, like, it's like you get to have a new relationship, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not like you are sitting in this space, and you're the daughter and she's the mom. It's like yeah. you're two creative entities coming into collaboration. And so I don't like I it feels a lot less um, exploitive than lots of ways mm. arts can exist. Yes. It's, and especially with the sassy mom you have. <laughs> you know, it's like she can call you in and be like, yes. no, no. <laughs> Definitely. She has no trouble calling me out. Um, and she also uh, articulates really well her boundaries. So she's like, I'm not really comfortable for this to be in, in the series or, or sometimes, yeah, she'll share something and she's like, can you pause the, the rolling of the, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, and my sister as well. So um, also giving folks space to, to make, make sure they feel comfortable in the, in the process. Um, she's often the first, especially when I'm working with her, she's the first person that gets to see the work um, so that I get her approval as well as she feels she feels good about um, what we were able to produce together. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's uh, it kind of goes from there. So thank you for your question. That's great. Does anyone else have any other questions? Um, I'll also just say uh, working with Faria over the past year has just been like the most amazing thing ever. And I'm just like so happy that my first um, kind of curatorial project got to be with such an incredible artist and like such an inspiring artist. And I feel like there was so many things that I even just learned for my own personal practice that I took from like our conversations. Um, and it's just been like so a lot of the things that we've been talking about have been so eye-opening but also so refreshing and like mm -hmm. uh just like really it's it's been such a nice relationship to have um and i feel like there's a lot of things that we've experienced that have been very <laughs> similar in the art world at least <laughs> um which is like both uh sad but also like kind of nice to be able to have that kind of relationship with someone mm -hmm. um so i'm very thankful for the past year that we've had working on this yes i'd like i'd also like to thank you ava because i'm not i might get emotional oh no <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, to, okay. <laughs> oh, to be given the space to like really create the way that you want is, um, I would say a luxury. Um, but now it is the standard <laughs> uh, for all of my working relationships. And so, um, I just want to uh, take the time to thank you for, whew, Oh, for no, giving you me that me space. All trying to. <laughs> and um encouragement um oh i knew it was gonna come out at some point but <laughs> but um but yeah uh in thinking of what what happened to monique's piece um it it, it really uh it sat with me it, it, it's still sitting with me um because that is a representation, honestly, of some of the relationships that are in 
this industry and in a lot of industries. Um, there is space given to folks, um, space given to folks, um, a seat at the table even, um, but a seat with no voice. And so that's not really a seat. Uh, and so to be not, not just given the seat, you gave me the whole damn table. <laughs> it was really nice <laughs> to be able to just run with it um, and be supported every step of the way. So um, Ava is a gem of gems. Um, whoever gets to work with her next is so, so lucky. Um, I hope that our relationship um, as friends continues and um, from a professional standpoint, like I would totally love to work with you again because uh, it was such a magical experience. Um, lots of conversations that just kind of go on it, it has really never felt like work uh working with you and so that's that's really special so i wanted to share that and make sure folks know she's she's one she's a real one y'all she's a real one <laughs> so sweet. i feel like i'm not gonna i can't say too much because then I'll, uh, I'll just be a little bit blubbery i think so i'm just gonna, I'm just gonna uh leave it there thank you <laughs> Um, I guess I feel like that's a nice way to maybe end out the talk. <laughs> um, I won't make you answer any more like very critical questions or something while you're um, <laughs> in the <this> state. <laughs> so um, I just want to thank everyone for coming and hearing about Faria's practice. It's such um, an amazing show to have in Calgary right now. Um, and if you still haven't come out to see it, please, please do. It's open until uh, February 11th. Um, so yeah, please try and make it out. If not, we do have documentation of it online if you are not in the city. So yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. I'm all blubbery now. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to keep it together. I even wrote it down because I was like, God damn. Oh. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it never goes the way you want it to like that. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Oh, so great. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm going to end the talk now, but it's so lovely to see you all tonight. Thank uh, you. Looking forward to meeting you. Thank you, Aria. Also, thank you, Dan. I wanted to thank both of you, too, but then I yeah. got all, um, <laughs> I, I got all blubbery. Theresa, <laughs> <laughs> who came in during your talk, like, wanted to have me to answer so many questions. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, we're going to watch the talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Maria and Eva. It was so nice to, to hear. And we'll see you next week. So this is exciting. So yeah, I hope you take care. Can't. Of I can't wait to see you folks. Oh, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> so exciting. I can't wait. I'm so glad that you're still recording this part. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>